Welcome to the physics video on momentum. This covers textbook chapter number nine, um, and it follows torque and angular momentum. Sorry, it doesn't follow torque and angular momentum, it just follows torque and rotational motion. Uh, anyway, this chapter should be a significant um, drop off in difficulty level of the math questions and the equations and the number of variables that you're dealing with. Um, so, hopefully, you find that to be a bit of a relief after um, chapters five, six, and eight were pretty math intense. So this chapter is all about momentum and we'll soon learn what that is and how to calculate um, various values of it and how it's helpful in problem solving. So first uh, we want to go way back and think about forces um, in a different way. So when a force acts on some kind of object we know it's going to accelerate according to F equals MA um, and that acceleration will cause the object to speed up or slow down depending if it's going the same direction or if it's going opposite direction. Uh, let me mention right now caveat uh, we're going to go back from two-dimensional motion into just one-dimensional motion. So things are only moving, say, forward and backward. Um, and so if you have something accelerating, we're no longer considering changes in direction. It's only speeding up or slowing down um, along this one dimension that it's allowed to move on. So there will be a change in velocity, either speeding up or slowing down. Um, and so we can combine F equals MA um, to relate the forces with our definition of acceleration, acceleration is change in velocity over time, and we can find a relationship between the force that we apply and how much the velocity will actually change. So just a simple um, plug-in here, and then if we multiply both sides by t, then t will cancel out and everything looks fantastic. So we start with, um, let me get my little marker here, we start with, we start with force equals ma, and then we multiply both sides by t, Okay, so the equations are still equal. And then in place of this A right here, we're going to substitute in change in velocity over time because that's uh, what the acceleration is, that's the definition. And now this divide by T and this times T cancel out, leaving us with force times time on this side and M delta V on this side. So all that's left here is M delta V. And delta V you know is V final minus V initial. And if you distribute the m in, um, you get mv final minus mv initial. So what that's telling you is when you apply a force over some amount of time, something is changing. Whatever m times v is, m times v is some physical quantity, and it's going to um, change its value when you apply a force over some period of time. The bigger the force you apply, or the longer you apply it for, the larger this quantity is going to change. And so um, it's nice to give a name to this quantity that's changing. And m times v, we've given it a name, and that name is momentum. So uh, the faster something is going, the more momentum it has, or the bigger the object is, the more momentum it has. Okay. And what's causing that change of momentum? That's a force times time. So it's also nice to give this a name. So this is called impulse. And this is all um, typed up on the next slide, so let's take a look. So force times time is defined to be the impulse. Force times time, the variable for that is a capital I, and the word is spelled impulse. So this is impulse. Um, MV final is momentum final. Uh, MV initial is momentum initial, and of course the minus sign. So MV without the final minus initial, just m times v is defined as momentum. Okay, so just at any given instant in time, your momentum is your mo mass times your velocity. And yes, it is a lowercase p for momentum, and yes, that is um, less than ideal, but m is already used for mass. Um, capital M, I think, is used for moment in some other parts of physics that we haven't learned about. Um, but we're just going to go with the textbook and historical context for these variables. And p, lowercase p, is going to be momentum. So you'll get used to it soon enough. Um, p equals mv. So if I say, what's the momentum of this object at this moment in time? Multiply its mass times its velocity at that moment in time, and you'll have its momentum at that moment in time. Okay, so this is called the impulse momentum theorem. It's the equation relating an impulse to a change in momentum. So the sentence would be, an impulse causes a change in momentum. This equal sign here um, is basically this word causes. So 
an impulse causes a chain of momentum according to the calculation or formula I equals delta P. Okay, so we can use this to our advantage. If we know how long a force was applied, uh, we can figure out the change in velocity. You know, you could still do it the old way as well. You find the acceleration and then use the equations of motion, um, those four equations from chapter three, um, but this might make it a little simpler. Um, but there's also, uh, here's some cool pictures just to, I thought this would be fun, uh, examples of forces uh, over time which causes an impulse which changes the momentum. So the pool stick hitting the cue ball, there's some small duration of time uh, with a large force and that causes a chain of momentum and then it hits the balls and the chain reacts. So there's lots and lots of forces causing lots and lots of chain reaction to give each ball momentum. And then of course if you punch someone in the face, you're applying a force over some period of time, their head or whatever part of their body you punch will gain uh, some momentum and gain some velocity in whichever direction you punched it. So just a little humor in there. Okay, so not only does it make those calculations easier, but significantly more important, uh, it brings up this whole new um, conservation law, which allows us to make simple, simple calculations on things that used to be a lot more complex. So we've already defined momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. I'll put that right here just for reference. P equals mv. But we can combine what we've already done, which was Newton's second law and acceleration, with Newton's third law. Newton's third law, if you remember, says that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, mathematically, for every force, A on B, there's an equal force backward from B on A. And so anytime you have a force over some period of time, like say I'm, I'm pushing, I don't know, pushing something, pushing a box for three seconds, well, the box is also pushing my hand backward for three seconds. And so <clears throat> we learned that there will be a change in momentum for the box if I push on it, but there's also a change in momentum of my hand. And since the force on my hand is opposite direction of the force in the box, and the time is the same in both cases, the change in momentum on one object will be numerically the same as the other object, but opposite sign, opposite direction. Um, so this is really cool. Um, the impulse on any object A is always equal and opposite to the impulse on whatever object it's interacting with. Say I just call it object B. Um, so if one object gains momentum, positive value, the other object loses momentum, negative value. And that's really cool because what happens is when two objects interact, the total change of momentum is always zero. This is kind of like um, money changing hands. If I give you 20 bucks, right, you gained 20 bucks and I lost 20 bucks, the net change of both of us combined is zero. The total amount of money at the end is equal to the total amount of money at the beginning. As long as you include both of our monies in the um, total. So uh, mathematically I'm just working it out a little bit right here. Um, this isn't really that important. What it leads to though is is absolutely critical. The total momentum at the beginning is equal to the total momentum at the end. Um, before a collision and after a collision, anytime there are forces exerted between objects, momentum could be changing hands, but the net total at the beginning equals the net total at the end. So if you can figure out the total at the beginning and you can figure out the total at the end, you can set them equal to each other and then solve for whatever variables are unknown, unknown velocities or unknown masses. So here's some examples um, that you've probably seen before, uh, but you've probably never thought about it in terms of conservation of momentum. So um, I'm not sure what these are called, but I'm sure you've all seen one. This ball right here is going to come swinging in with some velocity and some mass. Now it's going to hit this guy. So whatever momentum it had, its mass times velocity, is going to get transferred into this one. So it's going to lose it, and this one's going to gain it. Then this one immediately hits this one, and this one hits this one, and this one hits this one. So all the original momentum this guy had has been transferred through collisions over to this guy. And now there's nothing for him to collide with, so he's going to fly off this way. Now why does he slow down? Um, it's because he's going against gravity. Right here he's going horizontally, so there's no gravity against him, but when he's up here, if you visualize drawing a force diagram, the force of gravity is down this way and his motion is this way, so there's a component of gravity, if you break gravity into its components, this way and this way, this component of gravity is opposing his motion and therefore slowing him down. This component of gravity is pulling him outward, which is why there has to be a string with tension holding him inward. Um, and then he'll gradually come back down, and then this will happen and go back the other way. And it will go back and forth technically forever, because in these collisions, 
um, the total momentum before equals the total momentum after um, in a closed system, um, but there is a small bit of friction um, when the when the two balls collide. Uh, there's a little bit of sound produced. There might be a little bit of friction up here at the hinge, and so there's tiny tiny bits of energy lost, and so um, you know it's not going to be 100% perfect when you have these, but in our idealized no friction kind of environment that we're dealing with in class, this will be able to go back and forth forever as the momentum is transferred through the collisions. Okay, so anytime you're solving, oh, and one more, uh, anytime you have a cannon, if you've ever seen a cannon launch a cannonball, it starts off the cannonball's inside the barrel, the cannonball flies out this way, but what always happens to the cannon itself? So when the cannonball flies out this way, the cannon itself recoils backwards, or if you've ever shot a shotgun or a rifle or anything like that, or even even a handgun to a lesser extent, the bullet comes out one way and the gun bucks backward and hits you in the shoulder, or if it's a cannon, uh, you know, it rolls backwards. And so you might, what the hell, why, why does that happen? Well, if the cannon exerts a force forward on the ball, then the ball exerts a force backward on the cannon. Um, another way of looking at it is, at the beginning, both of them have zero velocity. So the total momentum initial has to be zero. Now here, you have the ball, it's moving forward, so it's got some positive value of momentum. In order for the total to add up to zero, if the ball has a positive value, then the cannon, the only way you can add up to zero is if it's got some negative amount. So it's just another way of looking at things that we already know how to calculate, but hopefully this will enable us to do it in a simpler way. Okay, so we're going to go through three example problems to help um, illustrate all of this and hopefully um, kind of hone the problem-solving process. All right, number one, collisions in one dimension. So this is a car crash. A 200 kilogram car moving 20 meters per second. Okay, Stuart, yes, I think 200 kilograms is probably too small for a car. I sincerely apologize. Maybe this is a go-kart, <laughs> except that'd be a fast go-kart. Anyway, a 200 kilogram car is moving 20 meters per second, hits a stationary car with mass 150. They interlock bumpers, stick together, and then, of course, they're going to skid forward what is the final speed of the cars. What that means is um, just after the collision. So obviously they're going to slide forward and slow down because of friction and stop. So the final final speed will be zero. But just before the collision, the car is moving 20 meters per second. Just after the collision, before friction has had a chance to slow them down, how fast will they be going? So what you should do is you should draw before and after. I like to just go like this. This is my notation that I'm used to and comfortable with. Before I've got a 200 kilogram car going 20 meters per second and I label just like this and I've also got a 150 kilogram car 150 kilogram car with velocity of zero okay then after they stick together right so this is like a double car and how big is it it's 350 kilograms and it's gonna be moving but we don't know V final equals question mark. So by writing it out like this, by drawing out your before and after, you label each object that's moving and how fast it's going, each object at rest, and maybe write V equals zero next to it. And then at the end, you label all your objects with their new masses, if their masses change because they stuck together or maybe they split apart. Um, and then you label unknown velocities. So whatever you have, you label. Whatever you don't have, you label as a question mark. Now we can set up our equation, P initial equals P final. Okay, my initial is m1v1 from this car plus m2v2 from this car equals m total because they combine together times v final so if i'm trying to solve for v final i divide both sides by m total divide by m total notice i'm doing this algebraically without numbers yet those cancel and i have my v final so to get my V final, I can plug in M1, V1. Well, that's not too bad. M1 is 200. V1 is 20. 200 times 20 is 4,000. Okay. And M2, V2 is 0, so plus 0 because the velocity is 0. Divided by M total, that's 350. Okay, equals final answer cross off a zero, cross off a zero. 400 divided by 35 is, um, 
Oh, I guess it's around 12, probably around 12 meters per second. But again, you should calculate this for yourself on a calculator. Um, but I hope this is, you know, it, the, the point is just to illustrate the process for you guys so that when you look at the homework, you, you know how to model it. So label your before and after sides of your picture. Fill in the, the values that you know, both masses and velocities on both sides. Set up P initial equals P final. This is your starting point for all these problems. Just like on a force diagram, you'd start with F net equals MA. On a momentum picture, you're going to start with P initial equals P final. Plug in, you know, what if you had six objects here? You'd have M1, V1, plus M2, V2, plus M3, V3, plus M4, V4, all the way up to six. I mean, there's no limit to how many objects you can have, but for each one, you have to figure out its momentum um, and put the total initial here, total final here, and go from there. Next example, throwing rocks off a boat. So if you ever are in a boat and you get stuck in the middle of a lake and your engine dies and you don't have any oars to paddle with and you don't have a sail and there's no wind and you're just totally stuck, um, what you can do is you can throw things off the boat. In the act of throwing an object off the boat, you put a force on that object one way, it's going to put a force backward on you, and if you're in the boat, it's going to put a backward force on the entire you plus boat combination, and then the boat will gradually move the other way. Um, so this is kind of a fun little problem, hypothesizing that scenario and seeing what will happen. A boy weighing 650 newtons. Okay, so right there, red flag, red flag. Momentum, remember, P equals MV. So what we need to use the momentum equation in conservation of momentum is mass. What it gives us is the weight of the boy. So it's giving us the force of gravity, which is MG equals 650 newtons for the boy, okay? That's not the boy's mass. So before I do anything else, I'm probably going to be like, okay, red flag, I know I need to convert this and figure out his mass. Okay, the boat is 120 kilograms. Um, he throws a 3 kilogram stone off of the boat at a speed of 18 meters per second. With what spo speed does the boat and boy go in the opposite direction? So, uh, starting at rest. I didn't say that in the problem, I apologize. Assume that he is starting from rest. Okay, so here's my before. And here's my after. Sorry, my handwriting is terrible. Before and after. So here's the boat, and the boy, and the rock that he's uh, going to throw. So this has V equals 0, this has V equals 0. The rock is 3 kilograms. The boat and the boy, see this is tricky, this is 120 kilograms plus um, however much the boy weighs. So we should calculate how much the boy weighs first. So right here, let's figure out the mass. The mass is 650 divided by 9.8. You guys should all be comfortable doing this by now. Divide both sides by G, so 650 over 9.8. Um, that's a little bit more than 65. I'm going to just write 68, and you're going to use your calculator and verify exactly how much that is. So the total mass here is 120 plus 68. Total mass here is 3 kilograms. Afterward, what do we have? Um, the rock is going this way for 18 meters per second. So the boy and the boat combined is probably going to be going backwards, and we don't know. V final equals question mark. Okay, so P initial equals P final. That's what we're going to start with every single time for these momentum problems. And P initial is zero because, why is it zero? This is not moving, this is not moving. Again, it didn't specifically say that in the problem, but I'm adding that in as a criteria for us. P initial is zero. P final, okay, you've got the rock, which was three kilograms, moving forward at 18 meters per second. So M1 V1 for the rock is positive three uh, kilograms times positive 18. Okay, plus momentum of the boat. What's the total mass of the boy and the boat combined? 120 plus 68 is 188 kilos times V final. Okay, so you don't have to put in V final as negative. Um, it's going to actually come out negative naturally when you solve the math, and that negative sign, as it always has been since the beginning of the year, 
that tells you direction. So if I've chosen the rock to be going to the right as positive, then when my value of my boat velocity comes out negative, that automatically means it's going to the left. Um, so to solve this equation, I'll let you go from here, view final equals. Subtract, so m first multiply 3 times 18, and that should give you 54. Subtract that to the other side, and then divide by 188. So this is going to be 50, negative 54 over 188, which is, I don't know, it's a little more than a third, something like point. 0.4-ish. Um, cool. So that's allowing you to find the velocity of the boat backwards. So you can notice that the rock is going 18 meters per second, but the boat is only going backwards really slow, like 0 0.4 meters per second. So why is there such a dramatic difference? Well, it's because the mass of the boy in the boat is so much larger. In fact, um, if you think about this equation, these are inversely proportional. P equals mv. If the change in momentum is constant, which it is, whatever one object gains, the other object loses, then the bigger the mass, the smaller the delta v. So um, since the boat has a much larger mass, it's going to have a much larger delta v. In fact, if the mass of the boat was 100 times larger, its delta v would be exactly 100 times smaller. So if you want to be clever about things, you might even be able to use that as a bit of a shortcut. Uh, but the tried and true method is always to draw your picture before and after, write down p initial equals p final, find all your initial momentums, find all your final momentums, and solve for the variable of interest. Alrighty, last one. Jet propulsion. A jet expels fuel at high velocities and recoils in the opposite direction in order to fly. So the way that the jet flies is um, it burns the gas and ejects it out the back of the jet engine, and so it's providing a force backwards on all those little particles, and then therefore, according to Newton's third law, there's an equal force forward on the entire jet. Um, so as we just said, um, the change in velocity is inversely proportional to the mass. So, you know, the mass of the jet is really big, and the mass of the fuel is really small. So if you want the jet to be able to fly, you need the fuel that's coming out the back of it to either have a lot of mass or to be going really, really, really fast. So um, it expels fuel at high, high velocities. The faster the jet engine can expel that gas, that means it's putting a bigger force on it, which will provide a bigger force forward on the jet. So suppose um, a jet has a mass of 2,500 kilograms. It takes off from rest. It expels 2 kilograms of fuel at a speed of 800 meters per second for one second. What is the final speed after one second? All right, so this is um, just, it's a lot similar to the, to the boat question. You've got the jet, and you've got the fuel and both have initial values of zero for velocity because it's at rest and the jet is 2500 kilos and the fuel is two kilograms so a lot of times I label my masses inside my object um, but if you don't have enough space or you know you want to label them underneath this is also a good way to do it so you have object one object two and then afterward we've got our jet going forward at some unknown velocity and we've got our fuel going backwards at 800 meters per second okay so we start again p initial equals p final the initial momentum is zero the final momentum is um, the mass times velocity here so I'm gonna write negative 800 for the velocity and 2 for the mass, plus the mass of the jet was 2,500, and the velocity of the jet we're trying to find. So when I subtract this to the other side, 2 times 800, that's going to give me 1,600, divided by 2,500, equals the final of the jet. And note, this is after only one second. So cancel some zeros. 16 out of 25 is a little over 3 fifths. So I don't know, point six. Oh, I don't know. Man, I can't think right now. Sorry. 15 out of 25 is point 0.6. And 1 out of 25 is point oh 0.04. So 0 0.64 meters per second. 
So after one second, the jet is only going 0.64 meter per second. So that's not very fast, right? That's barely moving. But that jet is pretty massive, so it's going to take a long time and a long runway, right, to, to speed it up. And so it's somewhat reasonable. I don't, I don't know exactly how r correct these values are. I suspect Stuart will be able to tell us in class, but probably a fighter jet weighs more than 2,500 kilograms. Um, and, and interestingly enough, I did want to say one thing. Um, they expel a large mass in f in fuel, and so over time the mass of the jet is getting smaller and smaller. Which even though, but the engine is working with the same efficiency, so it becomes easier to accelerate at the end. Um, very very similar to that is space shuttle launches. I don't know if you've watched anyone or heard about them. At the beginning, they've got masses and masses of fuel, and so when they take off, they just barely barely move upward. But over time, they're burning lots and lots of fuel so the mass is decreasing and as the mass decreases the acceleration increases so it, it takes off really slow at the beginning and then it starts to I mean it's accelerating the whole time but the rate that it's accelerating actually gets faster and faster and faster um, so it's almost like the engine is getting better and better but really it's that the mass of the rocket is decreasing and then when it drops off the two boosters um, then it really shoots up because the mass is so much less so you might say why the hell do they have so much on there in the first place and we can talk about it in class, but there's a critical amount of fuel you need to reach terminal velocity, not terminal velocity, um, escape velocity, which will allow you to escape a Earth's gravity. Um, that's something I'll talk about in class if you guys are interested. It's kind of cool, um, but it doesn't really have a place right here. Okay, so you've seen three examples. Um, I just want to reiterate the importance. Uh, want to reiterate the importance of drawing a picture, labeling your before and after and then setting up p initial equals p final. Again, these are all in one dimension, so that positive means one way and negative means the other way, in direction. Okay, application. How does learning about conservation of momentum help you survive in a car crash, or help car designers make cars safer? So, if you wreck your car, your change in momentum is constant for a given collision. Now, why is that the case? Remember, p equals mv. Well, whatever speed you were going before, it doesn't depend on how you crash, that's a set number. And after you crash, your velocity is going to be zero. So your change in speed, your change in velocity, is going to be the same no matter how the crash actually occurs. And the mass of you and your car is the same. So independent of how the crash occurs, if you are going and then you are stopped, your change of momentum is constant. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to minimize the force that your body experiences. Okay, so you want it to be a smaller force. But you know that delta P equals impulse, which is force times time. So if you want the force on your body to be decreased, we do this by increasing the time. So we want to increase the duration of the collision. So increase the time of the collision. If the collision lasts for a longer period of time, then there will be a less force exerted over that longer period of time. So this is why we wear, of course, seat belts. How does a seat belt extend the collision? Well, the seat belt is across your chest, and so as you as you lean into that seat belt, um, it takes time for it to reach its kind of um, maximal flexing as you lean into it. So it's still really short, um, but it takes a few, I don't know how many milliseconds, for you to lean into and gradually slow down by your seatbelt. If you weren't wearing a seatbelt and your head just went forward and smacked into like the hard um, front cover, uh, what do you call that, dashboard, um, that collision between your head and the dashboard would be nearly instantaneous, which would be a very, very small time, which would make the force very, very big. Maybe your head will split open like a watermelon, and we don't want that to happen. Also, cars are installed with, of course, airbags. So airbags are the same idea. As you sink into the airbag, that collision takes time. You'll slow down over a longer period of time, which will decrease the force on you. Um, there's lots of other examples of trying to maximize the time and minimize the force. Anything with padding on it, that padding takes time to compress, which extends the time of the collision. Bumpers on a car, they're made to compress so that they take time to compress and gradually slow the car down over a longer period of time. Pretty much anything you can think of that's made to keep you safe um, extends the duration of the collision. So I, I encourage you to try to think about some of their examples. Maybe in class we can make a list of whatever we come up with.
All right, another recap, even though I already did a recap. This is how important it is to recap. P equals mv. Okay, to find your momentum at a moment in time, you just multiply your current mass times your current velocity. Typically, though, in calculations, we care about the change from before to after. It's possible that some questions will just say, find the momentum here, or find the momentum there. But overall, the most useful part of it is comparing before and after. So in any closed collision, we compare the initial momentum to the final momentum. Um, in order to be a closed collision, you need to consider both or all, if there's more than two, of the objects that are interacting. Let me give a small example. Suppose I have um, a baseball bat and a baseball. And I say, well, the baseball starts off coming in one way, and then the bat hits it, and so the ball's going the other way. If I just look at the ball by itself, was there a change in momentum on that ball? Absolutely. Its initial momentum does not equal its final because it was going this way at the beginning and it's going that way at the end. So it certainly had a change in velocity and therefore a change in momentum. Okay. So if you just zoom in on one particular object, you definitely can't say that the initial momentum of that object is equal to the final momentum of that one object. But if you include everything that's interacting, so, you know, what else experienced a force? Well, the bat experienced a force because the ball hit the bat the other way. But did the bat actually rebound the other way? No, but it did slow down. So when the ball hits the bat, it loses some momentum and therefore slows down. The ball gains that momentum and bounces off in either way. But there's one more participant here, right? The bat is also experiencing a force by the person's hands that's holding it. So you have to extend um, your, your system, which is all the objects that you're including, to make sure that all the forces that are exerted that are relevant to your system are included. Otherwise, your initial will not equal your final. Um, so that's momentum before and after. And then an impulse is what causes the change of momentum in the first place, is defined as a force over some period of time. Uh, let me be very clear about this. When I say force over time, I mean the English word over, like force extending over some duration of time. Mathematically, it is force times time, not force divided. So by over, I don't mean divided. I just mean extending over some period of time. OK? Now, that's a good place to stop if you want. We've covered basically all of the linear momentum stuff. This next part is going to be momentum again, but now when things are rotating. So uh, we just finished a chapter on torque and rotational motion, so it's kind of interesting to see how um, those variables apply now to angular momentum or rotational momentum. Okay, so we already learned that torque causes things to rotate. Um, remember, torque is RF sine theta, just to refresh your memory. Good, good. So just like a force causes linear momentum, a torque will cause angular momentum, uh, which means it will change the rate of rotation. Okay, this is a dense slide with no pictures, I apologize. Let's read it out loud. Angular momentum depends not only on how fast you are spinning, but also on how far your mass is from the axis of rotation. Okay, so um, what it's like is momentum, regular momentum, is mv, right? So your momentum depends on how fast you're going, but also what your mass is. Well, with angular stuff, it's not just how much mass you have, it's how it's distributed around that axis of rotation. Think to last chapter, we said if the mass is farther away from the axis, it's harder to get it spinning, okay? And that was the moment of inertia. So again, that comes into play, the moment of inertia. If the mass is farther away from the axis of rotation, it's going to be more difficult to change the rotation. Um, and then likewise, you'll, sp you'll spin easier if the, if the mass is concentrated close to the axis of rotation. So a good example is ice skaters. Uh, when they twirl, they start off spinning relatively slowly, and their arms and their legs are fully outstretched. So they actually have a set amount of angular momentum based on their body's shape and based on how fast they're spinning. Okay, And there are no external forces on them, assuming that they're on a frictionless ice surface and there's no air resistance. So if there's no net force on them, there's no net torque on them, their total angular momentum is not going to change. So what that means is, as they draw their arms and legs inward, it's kind of like they're decreasing their mass. They're decreasing their uh, moment of inertia, their resistance to, to spinning. And since they're, it, you know, if you, if you decrease this variable, the angular version of this variable, you're going to increase 
the angular version of this variable. So we have this thing called angular momentum. I'm just going to write p angular. And you could write it as i omega. Um, there's actually a variable for it, but it doesn't really matter. Um, if you decrease your moment of inertia, you increase your angular velocity. And so you all have watched ice skating, right? When the person draws their arms and legs in, they start to spin really, really fast. And so that's kind of a really cool application of that. In class, um, we're definitely going to do this activity. Uh, and so I'll save it for that. But make sure, if I forget about it, that in class you remind me to do the bicycle wheel uh, activity. Okay, Here's a fun little comic. Uh, you can pause the video and read it. I just thought it was cute to throw in. Uh, here's the bicycle wheel activity that we're going to be doing. This little picture of what it's going to look like. Um, so this comic is cute. I hope you, if you don't get it, let me know in class and I'll explain it. But it's kind of cool. All right, last thing of the whole lecture, just about five minutes left. And this is only for those of you who are um, taking this class for the math topic. So math or honors, um, you're doing all the math questions. You're going to not only apply these collisions and conservation momentum in linear motion, one dimensional forward and backward, you're also going to have to apply it in two dimensions. And so just like with forces and velocities in two dimensions, you broke everything into x and y components, and you could do the calculations in the x direction separately and the calculations in the y direction separately. The same thing will be true for momentum. So it's twice as many variables and twice as much calculations, but it's not really, in my opinion at least, twice as hard, because all the equations are the same. You're just applying everything twice. Um, so. I didn't really prepare anything here, but I guess I can just talk about it. A lot of times in the book, they'll have, um, or, or just in physics classes, an intersection with cars colliding. So you might have um, car A coming in this way um, with its initial velocity, VA. And maybe you have car B coming in here, car B coming in here with its velocity, VB. And these two cars come in, come in, come in, come in, and then they collide. Typically, they'll stick together, and they'll go flying off this way, right? If two cars, uh, two cars come in like this, and they go flying off that way. So they might give you the angle that they fly off at and the final velocity and ask you to figure out, OK, what was the speed of this guy? What was the speed of this guy? Um, well, you can draw a vector diagram for momentum. Okay, so the total momentum initial has to equal the total momentum final. So this right here is your initial, and this right here would be your final. But you're not looking at the velocities initial and final, you're looking at the momentum's initial and final. So you'll need to find p initial uh, in the x direction, which would be this guy, p initial in the y direction, which would be this guy, and then this, you need to find p um, final total by multiplying the total mass of the two cars that are stuck together um, times this final velocity. And then you can break that into its x and y components. So you'll have two equations, right? This vector here, this momentum final vector to the right, has to equal this momentum initial vector to the right. And this final vertical momentum vector should equal this initial vertical momentum vector. So you'll have two equations, and typically you'll have two unknowns. Uh, but the way that you set it up, draw your picture, label yours initial and your final, uh, label all your masses and your velocities, you'll have two unknowns and you'll have two equations. Um, so again, ask in class if you have questions, but I just wanted to illustrate the, um, the setup for how you'll do it. Cool, that was it, chapter nine. Hopefully you see the math isn't so bad, it's just P equals MV. Um, impulse is force times time. Find your initial momentum, find your final momentum, and try to solve these equations. Uh, good luck with the homework, and I look forward to reviewing it with you guys in class.